Hi. I wish I had spoken at Kim's memorial, but I was holding my son and I wasn't sure I could talk. But if I had, this is what I would have said. From swimming in waterfalls amid ancient ruins in Mexico, to fairy hunting among the castles of Scotland, to chasing rainbows on the Isle of Skye, to walking with giants on the tippy top of Ireland, to watching the moon rise in each other's arms on the white powder sands of Tulum, to falling asleep on each other's shoulders in Westminster Abbey, from wicked tours in Charleston, to riding in a limo around Manhattan, from running through the woods of Martha's Vineyard, to riding down a snowy mountain in Utah, from swinging from the chandeliers in Palm Springs, literally, to dancing on a tabletop in Paris, from having our hotel room disappear in Amsterdam, to sitting on our swing in the backyard of the Royal Palace, wearing flowered crowns, surrounded by orange trees and honeysuckle. Kim was my twin soul, my partner in crime, and my truest love. Kim had many names, Rocket Sapphire, Vermilion, Rocket Larkspur, and Lucky Murphy. I always called Kim my merchant of marvels, and together we sailed on the ship of dreams. We met when we both played fairies in Midsummer Night's Dream at the Globe in West Hollywood. But I didn't just meet her. I recognized her. Our souls clicked. I distinctly remember laying in the fairy bower next to her. Me as peas blossom, she as mustard seed, and she singing the fairy queen to sleep in her bold, clear voice. On our first outing together outside the theater, I invited her to a coffee shop called Highland Grounds, where my friend Chucky Wise played New Orleans blues every Sunday night. I wore a long red cotton dress and braids in my hair. We were sitting at the counter, the music pouring over us, when Chucky's longtime friend Tom Waits walked in. Because I was completely enamored of Tom Waits' music at the time, and I got to meet him that night, I thought of Kim as my good luck charm. The next day, I invited her to go on my daily roller skating trip around the Hollywood Reservoir. We talked about rainbows and sunshine and beauty, and when I dropped her back at her apartment in Hollywood, I said, I love my life. Later, she told me that comment had stopped her in her tracks. She had never heard anyone say that before, and she wanted to love her life too. We became inseparable. Being together felt like coming home. We eventually moved into the Royal Palace together, and even though some might have viewed our little duplex in a sketchy neighborhood as non-magical, to us, we lived like royalty because we were together. It was like life bloomed into luminous magic when we were together. We gave ourselves royal names. She called herself Empress Genevieve, and I called myself Princess Selina de la Luna after the moon goddess. All visitors to our home came up with their own royal names from Countess Valerie to Princess Farhana. We couldn't believe our luck to have found a home in LA on our budget of less than $1,000 a month that had roses and honeysuckle blooming and drenching the air with their sweet scent. We had our very own orange tree and every year on Kim's birthday in February, the massive jasmine covering our house bloomed. Every year I cut the vines and made her a jasmine crown for her birthday. Kim drew and cut out large keys and tied them with a ribbon to a party invitation, inviting our friends to our housewarming party. We even gave out prizes for the best housewarming gift. We found ourselves hilarious. I remember that party vividly, 40 people sitting on the grass in our tiny backyard watching the back porch, which we were using as a stage. Because all our friends were performers, our parties became epic talent shows. Vina and Nina performed a gorgeous Indian dance that ended with them throwing colorful flowers over the audience. Dolphina did a pirate dance, and Kim and I performed the final number and improvised dance to Our House by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Kim and I both adored make-believe. We loved to pretend we were sailing on a magical ship through warm stories skies. And even now that she's gone, I think of her as captain of her own ship with the rainbow sail. We used to drive down the freeway in LA at night in my convertible VW bug with the top down. And she'd sit high in the passenger seat, holding my rainbow silk veil up like a sail. And we'd play ethereal music and sing and pretend we were sailing through the sky, giggling and whooping and trying not to lose the veil in the warm whipping wind. Kim's nicknames came from two books I gave her as gifts. Ship of Dreams by Dean Morrissey and The Merchant of Marvels by Frederick Clement. She loved the illustrations in Ship of Dreams so much she designed her bedroom in the same way, with patchwork drapes and a loft bed with wavy sides. 
She covered her bed in crimson and purple velvet. I had a velvet bag made for her in the same colors with patchwork stars on it. She filled it with glitter and her sun catcher wand that she could give away. We used to lie next to each other on our stomachs on my fluffy pink bed, marveling at all the wordplay and the Merchant of Marvels together and screaming in delight at the imagery. In fact, I can imagine Kim right now wearing a pleated red robe spun from shooting stars with a Milky Way veil or a dress tailored from a sheet of rain while I wear the ravishing winter dress that hides a carousel of waltzing horses under its skirt. And if you hear, turn the handle near my heart, it snows. If something bad happened at our house, we would say the wicked fairy Carabosa did it, and that would make us laugh. And when we drank tea together, our pinkies in the air, we'd say in posh English accents, can you see the parade of tiny elephants trumpeting right out of my cup? Delightful, eh? I liked to pretend my bed was Thumbelina's walnut shell cradle with rose petal sheets still warm from her slumber. We loved this image so much we bought walnut shells cracked them open, and glued tiny tufts of marabou in them, gifting them to people as fairy beds. We fantasized about finding a bottle of magical tear liqueur that had the power to transform any great sorrow into a great gray cat with velvet eyes. I could really use that tear liqueur today. And I know if my sorrow became a great gray cat with velvet eyes, Kim would care for it, feeding it and loving it and treating it like a queen. And of course, there's the magic monkey holding keys, the key to our housewarming party, the key I obtained from a magic monkey, a dealer in dreams on Paradise Street in Paris. Go there, my dearest. Tell him I sent you and he will give you the key, the magic key, the little golden key, which opens up the secret world of all dreams, the world of dreams where eyes open wide, mouths open wide, ears open wide, and especially my arms open wide. Wide, wide open for you, my dearest friend my love, my marvelous merchant of marvels. When I went to London to travel and see friends, the young man at customs asked me what I was doing in London. I didn't feel it was any of his business, so I vaguely said I was visiting friends, and after a great deal of hoopla, my luggage was searched, and they found my acting resumes and belly dance costumes, and accused me of trying to work in London. I was detained for hours practicing my headstands and cartwheels, while they filled out forms and examined my costumes. In the end, they let me go, and I told Kim all about the buttoned-up nightmare customs officer, who also happened to be cute if you're into cute buttoned-up Englishmen, which I certainly am. Kim was outraged that they would detain me, and she said, when I come through, if they ask me what I'm doing, I'm going to say I'm here on business. And when they ask me what business, I'm going to say monkey business. A few weeks later, Kim traveled to join me, and as luck would have it, she got the same customs guy. <laughs> <laughs> he asked her what she was doing, and she hemmed and hawed and finally said, visiting a friend. And he said, you aren't visiting Marcy Johnson, are you? <laughs> ha, she was caught. She was admitted she was visiting her wayward friend, and he let her through with no trouble at all, even though she was definitely on official monkey business. And of course, there was the time I went to the video store in Hollywood to check out a movie, and the guy said, Kim's account, right? My world was mashed up. I heard him say Kim's... Uh, Count, as in like Count Dracula. I smiled and said, Kim's not a count. And he stared at me and said, Kim's a count. And I was said, Kim's not a count. She's an empress. Now he was really confused. And he said, please don't do this to me. I've been here since 9 a.m. Kim's a count. I said, Kim is not a count. She's an empress. I'm a princess. There is no count. I couldn't figure out why he kept calling her a count when counts are male. He hung his head as the line grew behind me and people stared at me in confusion and he slowed down his talking like he was talking to someone mentally challenged and said, Kim's account, account. And it finally clicked that he was saying Kim's account and not Kim's account. <laughs> I burst out laughing, my face turning red and said, oh, Kim's account. Why didn't you just say that? His eyes widened. As he checked me out and I left the store, my mind still swimming with visions of counts and countesses and palaces and balls, of course. On my 50th birthday last year, I wanted to read The Merchant of Marvels aloud. I passed the book around my dinner party and asked each guest to read a page, and I pretended she was right next to me, holding my hand, gleeful and giggly. In my thoughts, Kim is wearing her red velvet sorcerer's hat, of course and her velvet bag with patchwork stars, and she climbs aboard the ship of dreams, of which she is captain, of course. The sail is billowing rainbow silk with star-shaped patches. 
The sky is warm and her velvet bag is full of actual stars that she can throw out into the sky whenever she wants. Dear Kim, I'll be looking up. My eyes open wide, my heart open wide, my arms open wide. Ready to catch them. Love you, Kim.